um, different types of therapy. I actually haven't heard of too many. I mean, um, I'm trying to look for a decent list of available therapies. So, I guess. Um, there's there's actually um, only three that were talked about when I was taking psychology courses, which was um, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and humanistic therapy or talk therapy. Psychoanalysis. Um, they're all based on psychoanalysis, but the focus of cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy or CBT is to recognize thought patterns and to change those said thought patterns into something different and um, integrate that into the client's behavior whereas dialectical behavior therapy is to supplement or kind of swap in a different type of therapy so that they are more responsive in a socially accepted or a healthier way <laughs> so it's like um it's kind of like teaching somebody how to quit smoking kind of thing so like they can learn gradually to quit smoking through i don't know they could use a vape or they could quit cold turkey um they could assess the emotional responses of the client to see why it causes them to have a cigarette um psychodynamic therapies I don't think those are I wouldn't really recommend one of those like they're usually um the only reason your therapist or your psychologist would do those assessments with you is if they are concerned about your interpretation of certain social settings and your relationships so there's these different types of tests so Vorschart test one of the most commonly used tests um they're not very effective they don't really say too much about the person or anything but they're used to kind of assess a person's um understanding of visual cues so the Rorschach test is like when they, it's an ink blot test um they present the ink blot and ask the client or the patient what is it that they see within the inkpot and to describe the inkpot to them. It's, it's honestly, it's meaningless, but um, they do, st psychologists still use that. It's very common for you to be administered a Rorschach test to be able to assess kind of, I guess it's a way to see how you're projecting. So if you are going to therapy, most likely you're going through one of those defense mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. Um, they use that to assess a maybe possible transference or um, projections that that person might be doing or will be doing in therapy depending on when it is administered. Um, there is the black and white sketch of situations. It's hard to tell what's going on in that situation but it's presented and the client is supposed to describe what they think is going on just from that one picture. That's another therapeutic assessment. Um, there's the um, IQ test. So it's actually Wexler's, I think. I think it's called Wexler's test. Um, and the Stanford Binet is a very popular one. Um, is it Stanford Binet or something? Something like that. Um, they administer those tests to assess a person's intelligence level. And no, it's not one of those like trick questions or anything. It's just a series of patterns and being able to recognize pattern recognition within the time, given time frame. And to see if that person is potentially suffering from neurological disorders by getting them to recognize commonly used objects. So that's what those tests are for. Um, that those are typically used in psychiatric evaluation or research settings, not for clients who are looking for therapeutic techniques. Okay, so if you're a psychologist, because you should be hiring a PhD to do this work, um, if they are 
administering these tests to you, it means that they are they're most likely concerned about the fact that you might be suffering from some sort of other disorder, not just requiring a therapy. So when you go to a psychologist, you are concerned about your behavior or the fact that your life, or including your social life, isn't going as well as it should be going, or with well as you believe it should be going. And then when you get there to the psychologist's office, they will do an assessment on you. Some people have different ways to assess their client. Now, with cognitive behavioral therapy, again, it's kind of like they're going to assess what the problem is. So they're like, um, what is it that is giving you a hard time in life? Let's say, I have a hard time waking up in the morning, right? Like, um, even if I'm awake by the alarm, I don't want to get up and go anywhere. And sometimes I oversleep and I don't hear my alarm, even though it's gone off. And that's when they will use the CBT to say that um, we're going to try to reevaluate what's causing this by getting you to talk about what it is that you do prior to the alarm going off and then why it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing for you. Maybe we can use different techniques or get you to kind of respond in a different way or think about the situation a different way to get you to have the behavior that is desired, which is you waking up right when the alarm goes off and then you going about your day. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Dialectical behavioral therapy is for clients who are typically have suffering from some sort of mood disorder or um, personality disorder or something like that, where they're trying to stop that person from hurting themselves. like through any means possible, right? So they're like, um, a lot of the times they don't recognize what they're doing isn't actually soothing them. You know, like when you're upset, you should do something. Most people, when they're upset, they give it some time and they think about it differently and they just kind of move on from that. With people who suffer from some sort of, I mean, it could be extra stress, maybe things aren't going well in their environment, something else is causing this. When they're stressed, they tend to do things that are harmful or detrimental to their well-being, and perhaps other people's too. So that's why they um, they suggest to go through that with dialectical behavioral therapy, where they're like, okay, maybe next time when you're upset, instead of punching your drywall, we can go and take a shower or go for a 10-minute walk. You know, that might be more helpful and conducive conducive to your well-being instead of damaging property. That's Even though it's your own property, that might actually result in you possibly hurting yourself, like, physically, or, like, having to pay all that extra for maintenance and repairs, or even having to mend that drywall repeatedly when you shouldn't have to. And they could even suggest, like, you know what, well, why don't you just buy a punching bag? Right? Like, uh, those big sandbags from those, like, boxing gyms. And you can punch that instead. Or, um, maybe instead of, and this is, this part is a CBT part. (laughs) Maybe we need to reassess what's causing you to be upset. You know, like, maybe that's not really upsetting, but it is upsetting for you. And you need to understand why it's not really upsetting. So that's CBT cognitive behavioral therapy and then dialectical behavior therapy is like let's do something else instead of whatever it is that you're doing right now which would be more helpful for you you know just try to make yourself feel well instead of trying to like you know taking it out on things and other people um humanistic therapy or rogerian therapy because it was carl rogers i think carl rogers or something um he was his therapy centered on this idea that um, each client is a good person who just hasn't been able to um, do good things. So they are they have good intentions, they mean well, but they aren't able to um, find, like, how do I say, it? it's not... It's not very effective. I mean, it's not... CBT and DBT is scientifically proven to be effective. 
So there's efficacy, there's change in behavior, and it does change in the person's happiness level and their life progress. And also, they are no longer qualified for whatever disorder that they were diagnosed with after completing those therapies. With humanistic therapy, it's more towards like um, they aren't really looking to change that person, but just to get them to recognize that they are innately good people that just haven't really been behaving or doing things that are considered good in society, even though they may consider it good. Um, they don't see their clients as bad people. So that's Rogerian therapy or humanistic therapy. It's from the humanistic ter- paradigm that says every human being is innately good and worth saving. Or in a way, like um, they're worth helping. So everybody is an innately good person and nobody is trying to hurt anyone intentionally. It's just a byproduct of their misguided intentions or their incompetent actions. That's the approach that they're taking. Um, those ones are really expensive. Only PhDs um, administer this. Um, with DBT and CBT, sometimes they have students practice on the clients. It's still effective. Um, Sometimes you have people who only have, who only have, who only have master's degrees. You don't need a master. Like, you don't need a master's in psychology. You could have a master's in some different things and still be able to administer, say, said DCBT and DBT. Um, there's no age restriction for either CBT or DBT or the humanistic paradigm or the psychodynamic therapies, which just focus on psychoanalysis. Right. So it's like um how to interpret these things that person is understanding and seeing and it's usually for clients or people who are considered the norm in society so it's something that's kind of going off and upsetting other people saying that um they're this person is not like most of people they don't fall under the general umbrella category of most people this what most people are like this person not really like most people so that's it's kind of where they start administering those kind of um, psychodynamic therapies, therapies. But um, they're all talk therapies. Just keep in mind, they're not. No one, none of your therapists or psychologists are gonna sit down and like get you to write stuff or whatever. Um, they're administering orally, so like an audit through audition, so like you're talking and they're interacting through conversation and um, with humanistic therapy there's no, there hasn't been any proven effect for humanistic therapy (laughs) I mean if the problem is that your client has low self-esteem and believes that they're bad people it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy Right? If regardless of what kind of person that is, so they're trying to get them to realize like just, I know you've you think this or believe this, but that's not necessarily true. Um, The most expensive humanistic one, like cost-wise, like you're gonna have a hard time finding a PhD who's practicing, well-known in their field, willing to accommodate you because you're when you're going into therapy, you are planning on being in therapy for an extended period of time. So it's typically a year. In Canada, well, at least in Ontario, you can get free therapy. But you have to sign up for it. And they only limit it to one year. So they said you only have one year's worth of sessions of therapy. And within that year, you should be able to say that you are good to go. (laughs) But, um... How, uh, like, it's really expensive, any of them. Like, a therapy co- session cost is typically, they can, they charge their clients per hour or per therapy based on how they think you're progressing, right? So it's, again, it's each therapist charges slightly differently. From what I've understood, the price point is 120 so that's where they usually set the prices at. per hour per session 
they don't do over two hours. They, they won't charge you $120 for a... The, you're not going to be in there for four hours at a time. Like, that's... You could be if it's intensive and you're going through some sort of PTSD or severe, um, some sort of disorders, and they, you might actually have to see a therapist a few times a week for them to be able to effectively treat you. But, I mean, a lot of people think it's like witchcraft or hocus pocus or mumbo jumbo. It's not. It's legitimately science, pr scientifically proven techniques that help the client to redirect or prevent their behavior and get them to understand um, why it's not helping or benefiting them at all, what it is that they're doing. <laughs> um, is it worth it? You know what? If you are constantly wondering why things aren't going well, as in, like, you don't know why you can't make friends. You don't know why things aren't doing well. I mean, people talk negatively about therapy all the time, but I have a feeling most of them might be jealous that you can even afford therapy. It's, like, it's a medical expense. It's costly, and, um, at the end of it, you will be, like, a new person, right? And they, they don't really want you to improve your life, these people who are jealous of you, so they will will most likely negatively talk about it. Perhaps they even had negative experiences in therapy themselves, which can cloud their judgment or recommendations to others. But look, don't listen to those people. Listen to what's good for you. If you need therapy, as in you are not wondering, you're wondering why things aren't going well. Why is it that um, things, like why am I always in a negative or cranky mood, even though everything's fine, right? And why is it that, like, why can't I feel happy anymore? And it doesn't really matter what your age is. Or, like, why am I not getting along with other people? That kind of stuff. Like, if you see that cons consistent behavior problems and stuff, and even if you don't, like, your doctor has mentioned this to you and other people are concerned with your behavior... It might not hurt just to have an assessment done. Like, you don't have to continue seeing the psychologist. But if you make an appointment, they can at least assess you and then learn how to, like, or at least tell you what they would be, how would they going, be going about your therapy that way. So that's, I mean, it's great for a lot of people. I mean, people get... Like, they're like, oh, don't you have any friends and, like, don't you have family members? Like, can't you just, you know, go get a hobby, um, join a group or something? Like, why do you need to go to therapy? Therapy isn't those things. <laughs> like, it, most likely you're ending up in therapy because those things aren't working for you, even though it should. Or you don't have those things. Like, you don't have any hobbies or you don't have much friends or, um... Even though you still have those things, you're still feeling miserable or you feel like your life is unfulfilling, right? That's when you should be thinking about heading into therapy and understanding why it's affecting you. Like, why is your... Why are you so... Why do you think and perceive and understand your life and others that way, even though everything is fine? So either things aren't really fine and you're trying to convince yourself it is, or... Um, things are fine, but for whatever reason, it's not fulfilling your needs, right? So that's when you start thinking, maybe I should start going to therapy, you know? And then you, there's a confidentiality con um, contractual confidential um, contract. Um, so they're not allowed to discuss any of the stuff that they've talked about with you in therapy to other people. But... Even to other doctors, if you have a doctor um, or a psychiatrist that you are seeing, you can you have to sign a consent form so that the your psychologist and your psychiatrist can send information, and then you both of them have access to your files relevant to your treatment. That's it. <laughs> so you have to send that um, you have to sign the consent form, and then get that to fax to your doctor, and then to your psychologist and then they can start treatment that way if not they won't be able to do much for you other than evaluating it individually and um they won't be able to tell each other anything regarding your specific case 
don't get paranoid. They actually don't do those things. I know there's a lot of movies and a lot of like people like spreading rumors and gossiping, saying, "Oh, what if?" Uh, don't get paranoid about that kind of stuff. They're not gonna talk about you to their friends or family or colleagues. They're not gonna do that. I mean. I had a therapist who told me that she was gonna do that. I don't know why she said that, but again, I had a feeling that she might not have been there for the right reasons. I think she was about to sexually assault me. I don't know why she works as a therapist. You'll meet, you'll find out like a lot of therapists who aren't educationally qualified are like that. So typically master's degree holders or people who aren't very experienced. Do you need that your therapist to have a PhD, preferably? I mean, they're they are expensive. It is a need, and you, a lot of people dismiss it because they think it's just you going there talking about your problems and blah. blah, blah. It's not. It's not really that. <laughs> but um, why should you not be ashamed about? taking therapy I don't know why it's a stigma I think it has something to do with the mental health stigma but don't feel embarrassed or bad that you have to go to therapy it's like getting a tune-up or getting your hair done it's not a bad thing it's not a big deal people some people can't afford it that's why a lot of them talk negatively about it because they're like I it's not I case not even within my budget and I get Jealous of people who can't afford those things. I mean, the fact that you can afford it, it's a pretty good sign that you're financially stable enough for these things. Which means there are things in your life that are going well. Things that you're doing right. So. Um, how do you know if therapy is um, effective? You're going to have to give that some time until you have been in therapy for a while. And then you can see, like, you will be able to notice a progress from beginning to end, but it's, again, don't get so caught up in other people's opinions and judgments of you or your therapist or whatever, because um, that's just going to take you, it's going to interfere with your treatment. So don't think about it that way. Like I said, there's a lot of jealous people out there. There's a lot of crazy people out there. There's a lot of people who don't want you to do well for whatever reason. They're going to be the ones telling you not to do therapy or like, you know, it's not effective or whatever. I think it's fine. Therapy shouldn't be so expensive. Personally, I believe it's a need. It's a medical need and it should be provided to people who need it but again it's not something that everyone can afford <laughs> it's like having your own personal masseuse or like being able to go out and eat at a restaurant like it's it's really nice but it's not it's like a luxury for some people even though it shouldn't be it should be like a requirement <laughs> If there is a court order, as or like if you are legally obligated to attend therapy, then it should be covered most of the time. But otherwise, oh, and also don't forget to ask your employer about these kind of things. You might have actually be covered in your health insurance through a specific therapist or psychologist, and in conjunction with a psychiatrist. So if they're saying we can cover this through these agencies, then you have to go through those agencies. But if it's not covered by your work, you're going to have to pay out of pocket, unfortunately. And trust me, it's worth it. I know a lot of people just don't believe in therapy or whatever. It's Your friends can't do therapy on you, for you, especially if they don't have a PhD in psychology. And if you're friends with a lot of PhDs, then most likely you have a PhD too, which means that most likely you wouldn't really be experiencing these symptoms. And you'd be well versed in meeting people or encountering people who are not as well off as you, who you can understand, who go through these things and why they go through it. Right? It's just kind of preventing you from being able to go through the same thing they're going through just by association or just by being in the vicinity of that person. But...
Okay, so what? Um, also, don't forget if you are suffering from any of the dementia related symptoms, you should also get assessed by a psychiatrists, and there are therapies available for that kind of stuff, including CBT and DBT. Um, for Parkinson's with the neurodegenerative stuff, um, there's not much treatment for it. There are medications available, and whatever emotions and responses you're getting from other people based on your um, diagnosis can be managed through therapy. But other than that, it's kind of hard <laughs> for a lot of people to be able to afford that kind of stuff. Is it easy being a therapist? Absolutely not. You see a lot of people's like, they're mentally unstable, most of them. They get emotionally unstable. Some of them become very inappropriate during therapy. Such as like, um, coming on to the therapist or like, um, assuming the therapist is like incorrectly perceiving the responses of therapists, which is why they are in therapy. Again, they're so trained and very well educated with that kind of stuff, so they'll know what to do about it without offending you or making you feel like they're, they're triggering your fight or flight response. That's the whole key in therapy. So the fight or flight response is triggered when there is an actual threat to your health or safety. If they're saying anything to you that could be potentially damaging to you by letting you know anything in that kind of way, it's going to trigger your fight or flight response. Unless you train yourself to suppress those fight or flight responses. But other than that, like that's kind of yeah, it's it gets stressful. There's a lot of a lot of the times there are criminals in therapy. Um, a lot of times they have people who used to be sex offenders, used to have um, very poor relationship with their families, been through tremendous amounts of abuse, um, have like a whole wider range of mental disorders or something like that. Like they, it's for a lot of people. Therapy will be very effective to get that people into a level where they can start working and being involved with other people in the community. But it's not going to gradually or even drastically change their outlook or outcome in their life. That's not what that's for. That's, that's something else. But if you are expecting to go into therapy thinking that everything's going to change... Right, like, I'm gonna all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm gonna be qualified for all these jobs and I'm gonna be able to manage a team of very skilled workers and all that kind of stuff. Like, that's uh, that's unrelated to therapy, not that you can't do those things, but that's not why you're going to therapy. You're going to therapy so that you can kind of talk to people. A person about your current emotional and mental state and why things are going the way it is even though things should be fine that's that's the therapy part um, can you get free counseling there is actually a bunch of walk-in therapists this is where I met that weird sexually harassing woman um, who they do offer free therapy services so you can book a time and it's free and they will provide that set services for an extended period of time um are they it's mostly just talk therapy because they're trying to assess you it takes them a while to assess what your problem is when where you're at but again i wouldn't really like go there after what she did like, I wouldn't... Yeah, oh, that's what he was trying to tell me. Yeah, I think he was... Like I said, I, I'm pretty sure some of them were sex workers. I don't know how they ended up working there. This isn't a sex work position. This isn't supposed to make you feel good. Like, you're going to therapy to improve your behavior. Right? It's to assess your um, internal, like, stresses, including anger. You're not going there to, like, feel try to get you to feel good about yourself or like try to like reduce these like 
symptoms of anxiety and depression that you feel. So that's not what therapy is for, <laughs> unfortunately. But, um, yeah. Um, That's so weird. Hmm. The, yeah, I was... And maybe that's also his way of saying he knows the type of persons that I'm talking about because there are people in his field of work that are like that who do take advantage of people in that situation. I'm like, yeah, that's fucked up. He says, yeah, it is. But I, I'm assuming some of them have PTSD. And some of them, um, they might be going through, like, they're starting to have problems from being exposed to people with so much problems like that. And they themselves don't have enough friends to combat the effects of being involved with, or being involved with the treatment. I actually did notice um, people who have more friends, or at least have a very solid, stable relationship with more people tend to have like the effects of um, daily life or like natural disasters, what have you, is less um, oppressive on that person than a person who doesn't have those friend things. So if they don't have any friends, like going through some sort of like let's say a breakup or a job loss or um loss of a loved one or something like that is going to affect them greater or even being a witness to a crime that kind of stuff like seeing somebody get robbed or being robbed themselves or something like that is going to affect them greater than if they did like if they had friends so friends actually prevent you from experiencing this kind of things in isolation, which amplify these emotional responses and gets you to kind of recognize that like things aren't always going to be safe. But if you have friends, even if you go through that kind of stuff, they're still there to support you and supplement you with resources, right? But without friends, they don't actually, you're not really there to like supplement your resources or anything. And there's no buddy to kind of console you or at least convince you or like you don't feel like you're protected as in oh sorry that happened to you you didn't deserve it right if you did that and you don't have any friends you may start thinking or being persuaded that you may have deserved that kind of stuff um not always true <laughs> but having friends is important I think Hard to get by without any friends, or at least any sort of sort of relationships. Um. <sighs> there are people who offer, um, based on your income, the amount of therapy that they can administer. Um. So, like, they're like, oh, if you can only afford, based on your income, like, $20 per session, then um, I am willing to adjust my prices accordingly for you because you are in need of it. But then you're going to have to go through the income verification and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I would do that, personally. But, it's always an option. I always see, it's better to have therapy than not have therapy. Just keep that in mind. Even if you don't really like being in that situation. And trust me, nobody really involved wants to see anybody in that situation. Again, that's not... They understand that kind of stuff happens through sociological effects and through someone's upbringing and all that kind of stuff. No one can control all that. So that's why they're there to kind of combat the effects of all that kind of stuff. Don't think that you are some weirdo 
you're not um, just because you have to go to therapy. It's always better to go earlier than later. Do people get better from mental health issues? Yes. If they didn't, they wouldn't even bother making the medicines. <laughs> there wouldn't be any therapy techniques for that person. There would be medicines, there would be a psychiatrist evaluating your progress. I don't know why people think it's a terminal illness. <laughs> I know they get kind of weird or whatever, but it's not the end of the world, like I said. Um. Don't go to your therapist for advice on your life. They can't give you any valid advice for your life. That's the thing. They don't actually know you. Maybe go to your friends for that kind of stuff. But for your therapist, all that kind of problems and why you're not very happy and why it's not going well for you. If you told that to your friends, I think 9 out of 10 times they will take it personally. Like they had something to do with it or that you just don't want to be friends with that person anymore. Or like there's something else going on in your life and they should be concerned about it. Right? So don't, don't mention that kind of stuff to your friends. I mean, that's why you're supposed to go to therapy and understand why you are going through that kind of stuff, even though you shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> um, I never really enjoyed therapy, but it was relaxing, I have to say. It's very confined. It's quiet. Um, they are evaluating you and assessing you and your emotional responses and your physical responses, so your expressions and everything. And it's not always the best way to go about doing things if you think that, that your therapist is trying to hurt you. Or a psychiatrist wants you to not get well. I mean, some people who have mental health issues, underlying conditions, can start thinking that way. But honestly, don't. Even if you think that way, don't. Don't believe that kind of stuff. You know, they're they're there to help you. I mean, it's not really called helping because they're doing their job. Their job is to make sure that you're being treated for your condition, and that's what they like to do. Which is why they work that job or the career, okay? And they are making sure that you are doing as best as you can do. Um, yeah, um, did you know what? People who end up in therapy come from all walks of life, okay? Like, some people end up in therapy and they have so many friends and family and they don't have to worry about money for any rest of their life, but... Yet, they still end up in therapy because they still help exhibit some sort of problematic behavior or symptoms that they don't understand why they're exhibiting. Right? I mean, it doesn't... Mental illnesses, like any illnesses, affect anybody. <laughs> There's no actual, like, preventative things for certain types of people for those kind of things. It's kind of like, oh, you've never had a cold in your entire life. I find that hard to, hard to believe. Right? Like... There's no way you can accurately say 100% I'm not going to be sick. I'm not going to get mental illness. Whatever. So, um, I'm going to be fine for the rest of my life. I mean, that's kind of... I think it's a little naive. Um, I never really wanted to go back to therapy for too long. And I could kind of tell just from the way that they were responding, they, I think they were trying to tell me that I wasn't really, this isn't really what's going to help me because my issues aren't really because of what, how I feel and how I'm responding, but it's more to do with other things that are affecting those things and my responses are not actually abnormal given what is going on. But what I'm going through isn't really normal, so this isn't really something that they can personally do anything about, even in a professional setting. So yeah, that's kind of... I mean, again, most people aren't going to go through this. 
most people will be going through this like just I just I don't know I have a part-time job and my friends all love me but I just I feel like I'm not I'm not worth anything I feel like my life is worthless is garbage or like oh I don't know why me and my mother just don't get along anymore like kind of like I don't know why <laughs> that right there is why you should be going to therapy if, if you let it just kind of if you don't do anything about that and you're already concerned about that kind of stuff so, like if you just leave it and you keep feeling that way you might get into a worse problem so just put yourself into therapy it's not a bad thing there's so many therapists out there um, try to kind of arrange it so that it's not gonna you know put it's not gonna be a bur it's not gonna be burning a hole in your wallet kind of so to speak like it's stuff you're able to afford it, and it's something that you need, and you're making time for it. Okay, it's, 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 it's kind of optional, but not really if you need it. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. Um. You don't have to, like, I feel like a lot of people feel ashamed to tell people that they're in therapy. I think it's a good thing. So, don't. Don't be ashamed of all that kind of stuff. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. I don't hungry. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. I have no energy today. <laughs> but I'm supposed to like organize the rest of the You know what? I'm going to leave it for tomorrow. I can't. I literally can't move from the bed. Oh, there's a piano. 